All right, so uh, how many of you have ever had something taken away from you in your life only to realize how much you appreciated it after it was gone? Most of us, right? So my presentation here is on the power of appreciation, and I learned something about appreciation when something pretty important to me got taken away, and that was my professional baseball career. So as you know, was mentioned in my introduction, I grew up here in California, actually up in the Bay Area in Oakland, and I got drafted out of high school by the New York Yankees. Oh, I see we got some Yankee fans in the house. I, unfortunately, I didn't sign with the Yankees because I got an opportunity to play baseball at Stanford, so I go to Stanford, play baseball there, then I got drafted by the Kansas City Royals. I see not very many Kansas City Royals fans in the house. Okay, fine. Anyway, I signed with the Royals, and my dream since I was a little kid was to play in the major leagues. And unfortunately, my third season in the minors with Kansas City, I was doing pretty well, working my way up, hoping to make it to the major leagues. I went out to pitch one night, and for no particular reason, I threw one pitch, tore ligaments in my elbow, blew my arm out. So just like that, at the age of 23, my career ended. Now, I didn't know that my career was over the summer that I got hurt. I knew the season was over because I got hurt pretty bad. I was playing on the East Coast at the time. They sent me back here to California. I had an operation on my arm. I ended up having three operations over the next two years, did everything I possibly could to try to come back because I love playing baseball. Unfortunately, when all the surgeries were done and all the rehab and everything, and I, I couldn't make it back to where I needed to be to continue to play. And as you can imagine, I was pretty devastated, right? It had been the focus of my life. But when I realized I wasn't going to get to play baseball anymore, I started to ask myself some important questions. And one of the questions I asked over and over again was, did I have any regrets? You know, if I could do it all over again, would I do anything different? And you know what was interesting? I didn't regret a lot of the stuff that I thought I would have. The bad games, the bad pitches, the time I got you know, all stressed out and upset. None of that stuff really mattered to me anymore. The only regret that I had was that I didn't fully appreciate it while it was happening. I was too busy trying to make it. You know, I was this kid from Oakland, raised by a single mom. We didn't have a lot of money. I was going to make it to the big leagues. I was going to make some money. I was going to be somebody. But up to that point in my life, even though I was pretty good, I spent most of my time thinking I wasn't good enough, comparing myself to everyone around me, and literally like holding my breath, you know, hoping that I didn't mess it up. And when it was all said and done and I hadn't made it, I thought to myself, oops, I think I missed the point. How many of you can relate to this in your own life? Right? Our stories may be different, our backgrounds may be different, but one of the things I learned at that time and have seen many other times in my own life and many other people's lives is that sometimes we have a tendency to focus on where we're headed so much that we miss out on where we are. And for me, it was a pretty painful way to learn an important lesson at a relatively young age. And baseball ended for me. I had to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I went to work in the dot-com world. It was the late 90s, so I got a job working for a startup in San Francisco and started to do that. And then I went to go work for another startup, and it was during the dot-com boom. And we were, this company I worked for, we were going to go public, and we were all going to get rich. And then the dot-com bubble burst, and I lost my job. And I remember looking around after that experience in baseball and then in business, and I thought to myself, something's going on here. And this was 12 years ago. And I looked at my experience as an athlete and then my experience in the business world and all those years of my experience as a student, and I thought to myself, I think one of the most important things for me personally, but for all the teams that I've been on, is the power of appreciation, being able to appreciate myself, the people around me, what I'm doing while I'm doing it, not after the fact. And it was just a theory based on my own personal experience. But after the last 12 years and having the opportunity to travel around the state of California, around the country, talk to all kinds of students and educators, as well as associations, lots and lots of big companies and organizations, what I found, the research shows and what I found personally is that the power of appreciation, as simple as it is, often gets overlooked, particularly in volunteer organizations like the PTA. How we can motivate ourselves and the people around us is by actively practicing the power of appreciation. So that's what we're going to talk about. Again, simple concept, simple idea. Not always so easy to practice in the day-to-day -day aspects of our lives and the work, the important work that you do. So we're going to take a look at two aspects of it. 
acknowledging other people and appreciating ourselves. Again, simple ideas. But as you start to really master these things in your own life and in the work that you do in your teams here in the PTA, extraordinary things can happen. So I got two promises for you from my presentation. I know you've been sitting for a while and you're just getting started on the first day here of your convention, but here's my first promise. And I'll ask you before we're done, so you gotta tell me the truth, all right? Promise number one, we'll have some fun. You interested in having a little fun? Okay, good. And promise number two is that the stuff we talk about, I talk about, but we're gonna talk, we're gonna have a conversation here. This stuff you can use for the rest of the convention. And more importantly, when you go back home and you engage with your teams and the important people in your lives, to really bring the power of appreciation into those relationships as a way to inspire and empower not only all the people around you, but yourself included. So you interested in that? Yes? Okay, good. All right, so take a moment right now, and whether you've been in the PTA or involved with this for many, many years, or you're relatively new, think of a time in your PTA experience that you felt appreciated, you felt recognized, you felt valued. And whatever just popped into your mind, or maybe you're still waiting for something to pop, <laughs> what I'd like for you to do is actually pair up with someone and talk about this. But I'm gonna ask you to do two things. We're gonna do a little multitasking here. I know you've been sitting a long time. I know you did just stand up for a vote a moment ago, but I'm gonna ask you actually to stand up, find someone right near you to talk to, and just talk to them about a time you felt appreciated, a time you felt valued, recognized, in your participation in PTA. And while you're standing up, see if you can stretch a little bit, just kind of move your body around. So we'll get a little stretch, talk to your partner. All right, make sure you switch. Make sure you switch so both of you get to talk. Okay, start to wrap up with your partner. And go ahead and stop. Go ahead and stop. All right, go ahead and take your seats. Okay. So, uh, did everybody get a chance to talk a little bit about the time you felt appreciated? Yeah? How'd that feel? It feels good, doesn't it? It's a really simple concept in life, but that when we focus on and talk about and think about Positive things, it makes us feel better, right? But here's something, I love asking this question to people. Because when I ask this question, I get all kinds of different answers, but a time that you felt appreciated, a time you felt valued, recognized. Here's one common theme, whatever people say in response to that. It's something personal and meaningful to you. It's something personal and meaningful to you. It may be some big thing, some big award, some big recognition, some whatever. It may be some very simple act of someone just thanking you. But whatever it is, from really big and formal to very simple in day to day, it's always personal and it's always meaningful. And that's true for all appreciation. And as simple of an idea as that is, it's important for us to remember because all of this is about relationships with other people and fundamentally at some level relationship with ourselves. Because how appreciation shows up in our lives fundamentally is in our relationships with others. So in acknowledging other people and appreciating ourselves. So let's first talk about acknowledging other people. Again, simple concept, but sometimes difficult to practice. There was a book that came out a few years ago that I absolutely love. It's called How Full Is Your Bucket? Anybody hear this book or read this book? Great book, highly recommend this book. Here's the basic premise of this book. Here's the metaphor. I'm a bucket of water, you're a bucket of water. We're all buckets of water. Every interaction we're having with any other human being, we're either filling their bucket with more water or we're taking a cup and dipping into the bucket. Now, maybe a little bit of an oversimplification, 
but pretty accurate if you think about it, right? Whether it's your spouse, your family members, friends, whether it's someone on your PTA team, whether it's someone you work with, whether it's someone you meet here that works at the convention center or at the Starbucks down the way, whatever. We're either filling their bucket with more water or we're taking a cup and dipping into the bucket. Now think of yourself in your life, particularly in your role as a leader in PTA. How good of a job would you say that you do authentically filling other people's buckets? On a scale from zero, you like take out a hose and <laughs> suck people dry. <laughs> to 10, you're like an overflowing waterfall of love and appreciation. <laughs> what kind of a score would you give yourself? What do you think? Okay, I hear some people yelling some numbers. I know a few of you are like twos and threes and you don't want to say that out loud, right? <laughs> or maybe you think, no, I'm a nine, but you're afraid to say that because someone might go, no, you're not. <laughs> not with me, right? But now some of us know, and I would imagine those of you in this room, given that you're not only in the PTA, but a leader in the PTA here as a delegate, engaged to the level you are, this is probably something that a number of you are strong at, personality-wise. And then there may be some of you that know, wow, this isn't something that I focus on as much. But whether you consider yourself really strong in this area, or there's definitely some room for improvement, or whatever the case may be, when I talk to people about it, most people will admit to me two things. Number one, I could probably do a little bit of a better job. And number two, if I'm really honest about it, sometimes it's difficult or challenging to appreciate and acknowledge other people. At least certain people, right? So think about it for yourself. And think again about your team, your PTA team. And you could also think about your family and your friends and maybe where you work or whatever the case. But think about what makes it difficult or challenging to acknowledge and appreciate people authentically. You know, as I've traveled around, you know, and I wrote this book on appreciation called Focus on the Good Stuff. So I have this conversation with people all the time and I'm always interested. And I've found that there are a number of things that get in our way culturally from really acknowledging and appreciating other people. And the thing about it is if we can identify some of the things that get in our way as it relates to appreciation or anything else, we can actually start to move beyond it. One thing that gets in our way is as a culture, we love negativity. Have you noticed? We're like obsessed with negativity. You know, one of my favorite places on the planet to come is right here in Anaheim, right across the street, Disneyland. I love Disneyland. I'm a hu we're huge Disney fans in my house. My wife, Michelle, and I, my wife, Michelle, and I have two little girls, Samantha, who's six, and Rosie, who's three and a half. And we live up in the Bay Area. But we've been down, we've li we, I think we've been down here like eight or nine times, right? The first time we came, the girls were so little, we thought, oh, they won't care, they won't get it. Well, my wife and I got so excited, we hadn't been to Disneyland in like 15 years. We were like, let's go again, you know? But here's what's amazing. And how many of you, any of you been over to Disney yet so far in the last couple days? Okay. Any of you planning to go while you're here? Okay, good. Some of you I know live down here. You're like, I'm not going to Disney. Thank you very much. I've been. Whatever the case is, any of you who've been or if you go, pay attention to the conversations happening at Disneyland. There are three primary things that people talk about at Disneyland, and I pay attention to this. Three primary things. Number one, people talk about how expensive it is. Number two, people talk about how long the lines are. And number three, if it's warm, which it probably is going to be, they talk about how hot it is. This is the happiest place on earth. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Right? And the thing about all three of those things is if you didn't know those three thing things existed at Disneyland before you came, something is odd about you. Right? But that's what we do. It's way more socially acceptable for us to sit around, even at Disneyland, and talk about how bad things are. And the thing about, look, there are serious challenges going on in our world. I don't need to tell you guys that. You know that. There are serious challenges in the state of California. There are serious challenges in our schools. Right? I grew up going to schools here in California, inner city schools in Oakland. I work with a lot of schools and school districts here in California. I am very aware, intimately aware, and have young children at home, so intimately aware of some of the challenges. I applaud you for the work you're doing, absolutely. But one of the things that we got to all pay attention to in our lives personally, in the work you do here in the PTA, and any other work we're doing, is that our negativity about stuff, even if it's justified, even if it makes sense, it gets in the way and usually comes out in the form of complaints. And if you talk to any really successful or fulfilled individual or team and any extraordinary leader and you ask them, what's the key to your success? You will never ever hear them say, complaining. 
you know, we just complained our way right to the top. <laughs> but we got to pay attention to our own negativity because sometimes our negativity actually gets in the way of solutions, actually gets in the way of the effectiveness that we could have with our team members, with the people around us. And sometimes just shifting our perspective away from the negativity, disengaging in it, noticing when we're doing it. It's amazing what happens. You know, my wife called me, Michelle called me about a year and a half ago in my office one day, and she was laughing, and she I gotta tell you what happened today. So she was trying to get the girls out of the house in the morning, which, you know, seems like a simple thing, but oftentimes isn't so simple, especially when one of them, Rosie at the time, happened to be two, right? So Michelle's trying to get Samantha, who's four and a half at the time, and Rosie out the door to go, I don't even remember where they go, it was the summertime, so it wasn't even to school or anything, it was just to get out to go somewhere, and they were running late. So as you know, right, with young children, it's, so Michelle's trying to get in, Rosie is throwing a fit in the house. And she's trying to get her out of the house, and she's throwing a fit, and she's just being really difficult. And finally, they get out to the car, and Samantha gets in the car and in her little booster seat and puts her seatbelt on, and Rosie won't get into the car seat. And it's one of these, you know, Michelle's out in front of the house, so she's trying not to make a scene for the neighbors, but trying to get the two-year-old in the car seat. And she said, I'm just losing it. I'm just about ready to lose. I can't feel like she won't get in the car seat. She's throwing a fit. She's doing all this stuff. And at the time, we were teaching Samantha some things about what to do in case of an emergency and what to do and all these things, right? And Samantha, the four and a half year old, sitting in her little booster seat, calm, very quiet, as her sister Rosie is doing the, the number she used to do when she was two, she turns to my wife and very calmly says, Mommy, I can go inside and call 911. To which Michelle said, in the midst of Michelle being so irritated and frustrated at Rosie's fit, when Samantha said that, she burst out laughing. And she's like, I was laughing so hard, I thought I was going to pee in my pants. I was laughing. She's like, I couldn't stop laughing. I'm laughing. I'm laughing. When I finally sort of gather myself, I look. Rosie had stopped throwing a fit and had crawled up into her car seat and was just sitting there. <laughs> waiting for Michelle to buckle her in. And Michelle then said to me, maybe me getting all upset and irritated about it wasn't helping the situation. But that's part of the thing. Our negativity, our frustration, even if it's justified, often gets in the way. So that's one thing that gets in the way of us acknowledging and appreciating other people. Another thing that gets in our way of acknowledging and appreciating other people is that, and I don't know, tell me if this happens with your group or your team. And again, think of just your PTA group. Do people ever gossip around you? Okay, just checking, right? So yeah, gossip is a big one that gets in the way, right? And we love to gossip. Our culture, we love to gossip. You know what I mean? So you have your meeting, and people are starting to leave the meeting, and there's a few people left, and then some of your people are left in the room, and you say, okay, good, close the door. Let's talk about how we really feel. <laughs> Can you believe she said, I couldn't believe she said that. What is wrong with her, right? You know what I mean? And the thing about gossip is it seems benign at first. And it is. But ultimately, it starts to become more problematic. How many of you are new, relatively new? Just say within the last year to your PTA group. Raise your hand. OK, great. So you're new to your group. So you come on, on board newly. People are excited. You bring new energy, right? And then you start to get trained in whatever you get trained, right? Or maybe that you don't. I don't know. They tell you something. Here's how we do it. Here's our policies and procedures. Here's what your responsibilities are. However organized or unorganized that training may be, you get some kind of onboarding training, I hope, right? But at some point, after the official training, you get what I call is the off-the-record training, <laughs> right? That's where someone very kindly says to you, hey, let's go out to lunch, and let me tell you how this really works, right? <laughs> and what they do, and you're really grateful, wow, thank you for giving me the inside scoop, and they start downloading all of the gossip onto you. But what happens is, you come in with a fresh perspective, or any of you are more, you know, You've been around with your group for many, many years. People come in with fresh perspectives, and then we have a tendency, and we don't usually have malintent with this. We influence their perspective with our opinions. And gossip to a team or a group, it's kind of an intense, intense analogy, but I always say that gossip is like cancer. If it's a little bit here and there, we can address it we can rectify it, we can get rid of it, we can cut it out, and it won't have a major impact. But over time, not addressed, it metastasizes, it spreads, and it takes over the entire team and brings it down. So our gossiping seems benign, but fundamentally what it does, it gets in the way of our communication and ultimately our ability to appreciate 
and acknowledge other people. Here's another one, and tell me if this is true. How many of you notice from time to time when someone gives you a compliment, you get a little funny about it? You ever notice that? Okay. This is a very simple one, but profound. Do you know what you're supposed to do when someone compliments you? You know what you're supposed to say? Thank you. Then, this is the most important part, shut your mouth. <laughs> I mean, really. Just stop talking. You don't have to say anything. Someone comes and gives you a compliment. Because here's what we do. And this will happen at this convention many times. So you can practice this right here. You don't have to wait until you get back home or get with your group. Practice it right here. Usually what happens, if we even say thank you, whatever we say after the thank you is almost always weird and insincere. <laughs> right? It's either a compliment we give right back to the person, and sometimes we mean it, but sometimes it's completely inappropriate. It would be like if you came up to me after this and said, hey, Mike, that was a great presentation. And I went, you too. <laughs> That's weird, right? But we're so uncomfortable with the compliment, we don't know what to do but give one back. That would be like if I came over to your house on your birthday and I had a gift and I went, hey, happy birthday. And you went, hold on, and ran into the other room and came back out with a gift for me and said, happy birthday to you too. That would be weird. But even worse is we argue with people. You ever do that? Someone gives you a compliment and then you start arguing with them about it? That would be like if you came up to me after this presentation and said, hey, Mike, that was a great presentation. I really got a lot out of it. And I went, oh, no. It was one of my worst. I'm kind of tired. I don't know. I gave a much better one earlier in the week. Sorry about that. And then you might be like, oh, yeah, you're right. You're an idiot. What was I thinking? <laughs> don't argue with people when they compliment you. Again, it's like if I came over to your house on your birthday with the president and I said, hey, happy birthday. And you went, ah, what is wrong with you? I don't deserve this. And you threw it on the floor. You'd ruin the gift. You'd offend the giver. And you wouldn't get very many more gifts that way. <laughs> and that's what we do. So you want to really receive it like a gift, even and especially if you don't agree with the person. You know, when someone compliments me on something I don't agree with, I've learned it's not my job to correct them. It's not my job to disagree with them. It's my job to learn to receive it. And if I don't agree with them, what I might do is I'll walk away from that interaction or that conversation and think, wow, that's interesting. I don't think that about myself. Maybe I should. That's a better opinion than I have currently. Because appreciation fundamentally is subjective. And if we can start getting better at accepting people's compliments graciously, it changes the culture of our team, because all of a sudden now, the act of giving appreciation to other people becomes less awkward and uncomfortable. And here's one of the things about our culture. And this is true whether I'm talking to you guys here at the PTA, I'm talking to a group of executives at Google, I'm talking to a group of middle school students, I'm talking to, it doesn't matter. One of the things in our culture is that we don't want to do anything that might potentially make someone else feel uncomfortable or make us look bad. And ironically, even something positive, like giving a compliment or an acknowledgement to another human being, a kind act, a generous act, a caring and even at times loving act, sometimes feels awkward and uncomfortable because people get funny about receiving compliments. So you actually do a real service to the people around you as you start to get more comfortable receiving those compliments. Because there's this thing about, it's like hardwired into us, again, not to have other people look bad or us. I was running in my neighborhood a few years ago. You know, we got a little girl, so I get up early in the morning, go for a run. And uh, I was coming to my favorite part of the run, you know, the end. And um, <laughs> I was turning the corner, our house is about halfway down the block, and I see our house, and I'm getting all excited, ooh, here it is. And I'm not looking where I'm going, and there's a lip in the sidewalk, and I don't see it, and I go down, <laughs> hard, like flat on my face. I haven't fallen down this hard in years. iPod flew out of my hand, hat came off my head. I'm laying on the pavement, inches from my chin hitting the cement. And as I'm shocked, laying down there, before I stopped to even assess, you know, did I break my leg? I immediately looked up to see if anyone saw me. <laughs> that was my main concern, right? Thankfully, there was no one walking their dog and no cars coming by. And I get up and I'm like a little dirty and I'm a little scraped, but I'm okay. And I'm like brushing myself off and like limping home, literally thinking, <laughs> at least nobody saw that. 
But it's that fear of awkwardness. It's that fear of what would other people think. Again, even something as positive as acknowledging or appreciating other people. So if someone compliments you, the thing to say is thank you and just let it in. If someone thanks you for something, all you have to do is say you're welcome. That's simple. You want to know the advanced version, by the way? Once you get good at just saying thank you or you're welcome just receiving compliments, the advanced version is when someone compliments you, you can say thanks for noticing. Ooh. <laughs> See how that one feels, right? <laughs> and it's not an arrogant, egotistical thing. It's really like, wow, thank you for noticing that. Thank you for saying that. It's a simple act. It's a profound act. You know, according to the US Department of Labor, they surveyed people in the United States who left their jobs voluntarily and asked them, why did you leave? The number one reason in the survey, 64% of the people said, I left because I didn't feel valued or appreciated. I speak a lot in the business world and even in the public sector about the importance of appreciation. But for you guys here, the important work you do in the PTA, this is a volunteer organization. When I'm talking to people in the business world, I say people work for two reasons. They work for money and they work for appreciation. In a volunteer organization, the money's not there, right? <laughs> you got nothing. So people tend to work in volunteer organizations to make a difference, to contribute, which is a beautiful thing. But the currency that you have to give as leaders is appreciation, authentic appreciation. And there's a really important distinction with appreciation, because we get this confused in our culture all the time to our own detriment with our children, with our peers and colleagues, and even with ourselves, is we confuse recognition and appreciation. They're related, but they're not the same thing. Recognition is a subset of appreciation. How many of you like to be recognized? Raise your hand if you like to be recognized. Okay, if you're not raising your hand, you're either not paying attention or you're lying. <laughs> now look, I know some of us like more recognition more than others. Here's how you know you like to be recognized, by the way. You notice when other people get recognized and you don't. You ever notice that? <laughs> now you may not say it out loud, but you think to yourself, how come she got recognized and not me? What's up with that? <laughs> right? Now. So anyway, most of us like recognition, but here's what recognition is. Recognition is acknowledgement based on results. You produce a result, you get recognized. Now, not all the time, but when we get recognized, it's usually for something that we've done, as it should be. And the thing about recognition is it's scarce by nature. You can't recognize everyone, because then it sort of loses some of its power, its, its value. If everyone gets recognized, well, it doesn't really mean that much. It doesn't really have that much weight. So as a leader, it's important to figure out how to recognize people effectively. When they do a good job, when they complete a project, they work hard to recognize them. Absolutely. Same thing with our children, our young people. So they get recognized for results and performance, and they know the difference between I succeeded, I did well, versus that I didn't. Now, the problem when we only focus on recognition, though, is we miss out on a whole aspect of not only being able to relate and connect, but a whole important element of appreciation. I'll give you an example from my baseball career. So now whether you're a baseball fan or not, you probably know what happens to the pitcher, which is the position that I played in the baseball game when the pitcher doesn't do well. You know what happens? Yeah, they stop the game. And in front of everybody, the manager walks out to the mound and takes the ball out of your hand and makes you leave, right? Can you imagine? Let's say you're working. Let's say you're running a PTA meeting, and you're in the middle of it, and you're kind of not having a really good night. And all of a sudden, I don't know who it would be, the principal or the superintendent or somebody bursts in the door and goes, hold on, time out, you, come over here. And you had to like pick up all your stuff and everything, and you're like, okay, and you had to walk out. And some other person walked right in with some other stuff and sat down in your chair and started leading the meeting. That would be kind of embarrassing, right? Now, so that's what it's like to get taken out of the game. Now, if it's like late in the game, you know, seventh or eighth inning, and I'm just getting a little tired, and the manager comes out to take me out, that's fine, because he'd come out and say something nice. Hey, Robin, you're getting a little tired, man. We're going to get someone to replace you. But if it's like the second inning, and it's already seven to nothing, that's not so fun, because he'd come out, 
take the ball out of my hand. He usually wouldn't say anything, or if he did, it wasn't very nice. And I'd come off the mound, upset, embarrassed, frustrated. And if we were on the road, you know, in the other team's ballpark, it was always worse, because as I'd walk into the dugout, there'd always be some mean, heckling fans right above the dugout saying horrible things, you know, about my mother, right? <laughs> and then I'd go sit in the dugout, nobody would talk to me, right? Watch an Angels game, or a Dodgers game, or Padres, or Giants, or A's, or whoever. Just watch a baseball game on TV. See what happens when the pitcher does bad. That's what'll happen. Oh, leave him alone, he's upset. But you know what I could have used in those days when I was sitting on the bench after just giving up seven runs in the second inning? A hug. I don't, I don't know about a hug, but I mean, it would have been fine with me. I might have just scared some of my teammates, you know? But yes, yeah, some kind of appreciation, not recognition. What are they going to do? Come over and go, hey, Robbins, great job, man. Seven runs in the second inning. Woo! No, I had done a bad job. And in fact, not only did I fail personally, but my failure impacts the team. So our performance, what we do, has impact. So there's a level of accountability we got to create on our teams if we're going to have people produce and perform. Absolutely. However, as a living, breathing, often insecure, although I pretended not to be, especially in those days, human being, what I could have used when I failed was some appreciation. Not for what I'd done, but for who I am. And that's a place where I think we really get off track with this. It's not simply just thanking people for a good job. It's not simply recognizing results. That's a piece of it. It's being able to acknowledge people for who they are, not simply what they do. Because, you know, one of the things that I do with my girls that's really important to me, and I started doing this about a year ago, I don't even know exactly how we started it. But here's what I say to my girls all the time, almost daily. I'll say to one of them, oftentimes each of them, sometimes together, usually just one-on-one. -on -one. Remember, Rosie's three and a half and Samantha's six. I'll say, hey, Rosie, how much does daddy love you? And when I ask that, here's what the girls do. They go, this much. It's this little cute game, right? And I'll say, that's right. And then I ask them a very important question. I say, how come daddy loves you so much? And you know what they say in response? They say, because I'm me because I'm me. <laughs> and here's the deal. I say that for them, because I want them to get the message that I don't just love them because they're cute, I don't just love them when they listen, I don't just love them when they do what they're supposed to do. But I say it for me for two reasons. The first reason is to remind myself, as I will probably have to continue to remind myself through the course of parenting, <laughs> that I can, yeah, especially when they become teenagers, so I've heard, I can love them even when I don't like what they're doing. And the second reason is, my parents did the best job they could, as did my teachers and everyone around me, but I don't know about you, but I did not get that message as a kid. What I interpreted was, I was only as good as how I performed. I was only as good as my results, on the baseball field, in the classroom, whatever it was, fill in the blank. And so as I say it to my daughters, I'm actually saying it to them, but I'm saying it to myself, even in my life right now, to remind myself that my value as a human being isn't simply on, did I give a good speech? Did I write a good book? Do people like me? And I think for all of us, when we really break it down on a personal level, appreciating other people, valuing other people, our ability to communicate that, our ability to express that to other human beings. That's what real leadership's about. How do you get the most out of people? How do you get people engaged and inspired to want to partner with you, work with you, join the team, put in the effort to do the important work that you do? You practice seeing who they are, appreciating who they are, and acknowledging that. Even if you don't always like them or agree with them. And it's not easy. It's one of the things, one of the many things that makes leadership difficult, is you gotta lead everybody, not just the people you like and agree with. But appreciation is really the key. And by the way, appreciating other people is for them, absolutely, but it's also for you, because it has a big impact. Take a moment right now. We'll do a quick little exercise on this. 
close your eyes. Think of someone on your PTA team who you have a difficult time with. <laughs> Sounds like you have one of those people. Just, but honestly, focus on one person that you find difficult to deal with, you're frustrated with, stresses you out, irritates you. Just think of that person. Hold that person in your mind. And as you're thinking about them right now, notice how you feel thinking about them. Notice the thoughts, the feelings that are associated with that. And just pay attention to it. Now what I'd like for you to do is take a breath and think of someone else. Think of someone who you really appreciate. Someone on your team that you really respect, admire, value, you're grateful for. Wow, they really make your life easier, make your job easier. Really so glad this person is on the team. I don't know what I would do without this person. Maybe there's more than one, but just focus on one person. What do you appreciate about them? And just again, notice any thoughts or feelings associated with it. Notice even any body sensation, whatever. Just notice how it feels to just focus on someone you appreciate. And take a breath and now open your eyes. How many of you noticed it was different thinking about the first person than the second person? Right? It's like an understatement. But here's the interesting thing. You just made that up in your mind. I know those people really exist. But you just focused on this person that you don't appreciate, you find difficult or challenging, and noticed that you had certain thoughts, certain feelings, certain reaction associated to that. And then when you focused on the person that you appreciate, it was a different experience, right? They've scientifically proven, by the way, that if we hold an affirmative, appreciative thought for just like eight to 10 seconds, it changes our body chemistry. It changes our nervous system. And we think it's about the other person. And I'm not saying people aren't responsible for what they do or don't do, but here's the deal. You and I, focus our attention in certain directions, and that's what creates the dynamic. Because how many of you have ever met someone and thought to yourself, I do not like them? You ever had that experience? Okay, and then you got to know them and you realized, oh, I was wrong. Bad first impression, whatever, right? And you changed your opinion, and all of a sudden the relationship changed. How many of you have ever met someone who really liked them? You know, you might have like fallen in love and married them, and then decided, nope, not so much. You ever done that? Okay. So let's just say that most of us are masters at changing our opinions about people. And that's what appreciation is about. It's focusing on something different. And this is powerful stuff if you can do this. You know, I was speaking to a school district here in California at the beginning of the school year, so just in the fall. And they had a meeting as they were getting ready for the school year to start, and all the principals from all the schools in the district, from the elementary schools, you know, all the way through, is a pretty big school district middle schools, high schools, and I gave a talk to them about appreciation. And one of the principals came up to me after, and he said, you know what, Mike, thanks for talking about what you talked about, because we do have a gossip problem at our school. And he said, and it's not really with our students, it's with our teachers. He said, I have a really good staff and they're talented, but man, there's a lot of gossip and negativity. He said, what could I do? And we talked a little bit, and I gave him a few ideas from my book, Focus on the Good Stuff, and he said, I'm going to pick up a copy of the book and I'm going to read some of that stuff and I'm going to see what I can put into practice that would resonate with my staff. So he said he read the book and then they started to do some things at their staff meetings and one of his staff members came up with an idea as they started to address their gossip problem. He said, what if we flipped it on its head? He said, let's institute something we call possip. Possip, what's that? Positive gossip. And so he challenged everybody, start looking for things you appreciate, start looking for good stuff happening around the school, start looking for, some of the teachers were into it, some of them thought it was kind of lame, whatever, they were like, okay, fine. But people started to get into it. 
And the principal called me after they'd been doing this for about a month. He says, you're not going to believe it. The culture of our school has changed dramatically. Dramatically. He said, the teachers are looking for stuff. They're trying to find things they appreciate about each other and letting them know. And we're talking about, instead of when I walk into the lunchroom, instead of people commiserating and complaining and gossiping, they're actually talking about things. Did you see Mr. Johnson, what he was doing with his third period class? So that's part of what it takes with your team, with your schools, is figuring out how do we focus more on the good stuff about other people. But you know where it starts? Our relationship with ourselves. Fundamentally, appreciation is about us. Because we don't see other people as they are, we see them as we are. How many of you notice from time to time you have a tendency to be a little hard on yourself? Any of you? Okay. Some of you are so hard on yourself, you wouldn't even raise your hand for that, right? <laughs> Don't raise your hand, that looks bad, right? Yeah. So we have a tendency to be hard on ourselves, critical of ourselves. We all have something in our, in our mind, this little voice. I like to call it the gremlin, constantly criticizing. A few of you are going, what's he talking about? I don't have a gremlin. That's the gremlin. But the gremlin is constantly there to create. Have you ever sent an email out to a group of people, copied yourself on it, and realized you made like a really embarrassing typo? You ever done that? And then you hear your gremlin going, they all know you're an idiot. <laughs> That's the gremlin. You know, and we're not taught to appreciate ourselves. We're not taught that by people who are really well-intentioned. You know, my mother taught me so many really important things. She was the one who taught me, you can't love anyone else unless you what? Love yourself. You know, and it's interesting, I've been thinking about my mother a lot today. This is actually, would be, her birthday. She passed away last year. May 9th is my mother's birthday. And so I feel honored to be here today because my mother actually was not involved in the PTA. She was a single mom. She was a teacher. Yes, she was a PE teacher. My mom was a PE teacher. She taught me how to play baseball, actually. She instilled a love of books. I, was, I saw Maurice Sendek passed away on Tuesday. And I was really struck by my favorite book as a kid was Where the Wild Things Are, that my mom read to me over and over and over again. And now as a parent, I have a deeper appreciation <laughs> for that experience. But you know, one of the things I remember asking my mom when I was a kid, this whole idea of, you know, we're taught, like, don't brag about yourself, right? It's rude. People don't like it. Did you guys get taught that? My mom used to say that to me. And I remember asking her when I was like eight years old, hey, mom, how come you get to brag about me? Because she would brag about me all the time, right? She'd say, you can't brag about yourself. And then we'd go play. She'd brag about me to everybody. How come you get to brag about me and I don't? And she said, um, hmm, I don't know. Those are the rules. That's just how it goes, right? <laughs> So we're not supposed to brag about ourselves. We're not supposed to be, think too highly of ourselves. But fundamentally, what appreciation is about, it's not about bragging and boasting. It's about recognizing our own value, patting ourselves on the back. You know, one of the things I know about each and every one of you in this room, and I know very few of you do I know personally. Met some of you earlier today at the workshop, some of you back in July when I spoke at the uh, board of managers meeting. But here's what I know about every single one of you in this room. You're committed to making a difference. And you probably work tirelessly in your life, not just in the PTA, but in other areas too, where you give of yourself, you give of yourself, you give of yourself, and that's such a beautiful thing. So I really want to acknowledge you for that. And one of the things I know about people who give a lot is one of the places we forget to give to is where? Ourselves. And it's so important. It's so important. You know, I was watching Larry King about five or six years ago, and he had a guest on named Dr. Andrew Weil. Do you guys know who Dr. Andrew Weil is? Dr. Andrew Weil is a medical doctor, Harvard trained, who opened a center in Arizona about 30 years ago focused on alternative healing. And he's been one of the four, you know, one of the leaders on the forefront in the alternative health movement for many years. I really like him, respect him, read a lot of his books, think he talks about some really important stuff. And he said something in that interview with Larry King that I thought was profound. And I'd never heard it explained quite this way. He said, you know, self-care, taking care of ourselves, isn't just something that we do after everything's handled. It's something we got to do first. And it's so important. And he said, the human body knows this. He said, there's a mechanism in the human body that we all share 
that's a perfect metaphor for this. It's the human heart. So all of our hearts are beating right now, right? 50, 60, 70 times a minute, just like this. We don't have to think about it, it's just happening. And what he said is that the, when the heart beats, there's two parts to the beat. The first part of the beat, the heart pumps blood to itself. The second part of the beat, the heart pumps blood to the rest of the body. Just like that, has to work that way. Can't work any other way. Your ability to appreciate and value yourself, pat yourself on the back, fill your own bucket, gives you the capacity to do that for the people around you. And I know, just by the fact that you're here, that you take on a lot of responsibility in your life. You're committed to serving and to giving, and again, that's such a beautiful thing. But my invitation to you, my challenge to you, is to see if you can move yourself up the list a little more and appreciate yourself, so that you can authentically do that for others. Self-appreciation is not an act of narcissism or self-absorption. It's one of the best things we can do to make a difference for others. You know, people ask me all the time, given the work that I do, they'll come up to me and they'll say, how do I get my teenage son? How do I get my young daughter? How do I get my kids to be more grateful and appreciative? And I say, well, there's really only two ways. The first thing you can do is model it like Gandhi taught us, be the change. Be the change. How do you talk about yourself? How do you treat yourself? How do you talk about life? What, what kind of conversations are coming up? That's the first thing. And the second thing you can do is appreciate them authentically, not lecture them and tell them they should be more grateful and appreciative. I used to get that lecture, never made me feel more grateful, right? <laughs> but appreciate them so they can feel it, they can sense it. That's how we do it. We acknowledge other people, we appreciate ourselves. So I'm gonna close with one more story, but before I do that, let me say a couple things. Well, first let me ask a couple questions. First question is, did you have a little fun during my presentation? Okay, good. It's important. Second question is, did you get some ideas or reminded of some stuff you already know that you can take from this presentation and actually use? Okay. I invite you over the next three, four days that you're here at this convention to practice this. Appreciate each other. Receive compliments from each other graciously. And spend a little time patting yourself on the back for the important work that you're doing. Are there challenges? Absolutely. Are there things to improve? Of course, there always are going to be. But there's a lot of good stuff that's happening right here in this organization, in your community, that if you can acknowledge and appreciate that, it will grow. So I'm going to close with this story. I'll stick around after. I know you guys have been here a long time. You're going to head off to do the next thing you got to do at the event and get some food and all that stuff. But if you have questions for me or want to chat with me, I'll be in the back. There's a table back there on, the, on your right-hand side, the left-hand side as you're walking out. It actually has some sign-up sheets. I have a free email newsletter that I send out every couple weeks. Article that I write, audio podcast that I record, simple stuff. It's free if you're interested in that. You'd like to stay in touch with me. You'd like to get reminders, some inspiration stuff related to appreciation. You can just put your name and email address on there and we can stay in touch that way, okay? So this final story, as I share this, what I'd like for you to do is think about someone in your life who you really appreciate. And my invitation to you, my challenge to you is to let them know. This last story is about my mom and uh, you know, I mentioned my mom, my mom passed away last year. And my mom and I had, as many of us have with our parents, we, you know, we had an up and down relationship. But there was a lot of really good stuff. And one of the things that happens when someone passes away is, puts a lot of things in perspective. But there was something that happened about seven or eight years ago with my mother that was a really profound moment of appreciation in my life that I want to share just as a way to close my presentation here. How many of you have ever seen those Chicken Soup for the Soul books? Yeah. Most of you have, right? They got chicken soup for every soul you could imagine. <laughs> and I love these books. I've loved them for years and have a bunch of them at home. And about eight years ago, I got an email that said they were coming out with a new chicken soup book and they were looking for stories. And I got excited. It was before I'd published my books and I decided I wanted to write a story and submit it to be considered to be published in this chicken soup book. This one was called Chicken Soup for the Single Parent Soul. Now my folks split up when I was three and my mom never remarried. And she raised me and my older sister as a single mom. 
And because my dad wasn't around and because my mom was a PE teacher, as I mentioned, and I said this earlier, she was the one that taught me how to throw and catch. So the story that I wrote to send into the Chicken Soup book was called Mom Taught Me to Play Baseball. And in the story, I just shared all about what she'd done and everything she taught me and what she'd sacrificed, and it was just an acknowledgement of her. Now, I was a little embarrassed when I wrote it because I didn't think they'd publish it. I told my wife, I shared it with my wife, and she liked it, and I sent it in. I didn't tell anybody else. And I waited for a few months, and I didn't hear anything back, and then about five or six months after I'd sent it in, I get an email back one day out of the blue, and they say, congratulations, your story's going to be in the book. And I was super excited. I told Michelle, you know, like I said, it was before my books had been published. It was a really big deal. I said, Michelle, i got to call my mom. This is so cool. And she says, don't call her. I said, what do you mean don't call her? She said, well, what if you wait till the book comes out? You could surprise her. I said, oh, that's a good idea. So I emailed back to the chicken soup folks. I said, when does the book come out? They said, 14 months. <laughs> 14 months. That's a long time. I mean, I'm good at keeping a secret, but could 14 months? So I tell Michelle, I said, 14 months. She said, wow. I said, well, okay. She said, well, let's not tell anybody so your mom doesn't find out. Let's see if we can keep a secret. And amazingly, we did. We didn't tell a soul. Nobody found out. 14 months passed. The book comes out right around my birthday in February. And I get a copy of it, and I wrap it up. And we're having dinner with our family, just us, just the family, not a big thing. And after we eat dinner, we sit down in the living room, because my family has some presents for me. And we sit down, and I turn to my mom, and I said, hey, mom, before I open up my presents, I actually have a present for you. And I hand it to her. And she looks at it and she goes, oh, honey, that's very sweet, but you know, it's your birthday. I'll look at it later. <laughs> now she's like messing up my plan, right? <laughs> so I pick it up, but I said, Mom, I know it's my birthday, but do me a favor, would you just open it up? And she's like, open, oh, Mike, okay, fine. So she opens it and goes, oh, nice, they did one for single parents. Okay, I'll read it when I get home. <laughs> I picked it back up and I said, hey, Mom, listen, um, I read the book and there's a story in here that really reminds me of you. I said, in fact, I put a bookmark. It's on page 294. Um, <laughs> would you do me a favor? Would you read it out loud to everyone? And my mom's like, what, what are you talking about? Now she's sort of flustered and a little annoyed with me. Okay, fine. And she starts to read and doesn't even realize what it is. And the first line of the story says, on June 1st, 1995, I was standing on the pitcher's mound at Rosenblatt Stadium in Omaha, Nebraska, about to throw my first pitch in the College World Series. And my mom looks up and goes, this guy pitched in the College World Series. Totally not getting it, right? <laughs> and then she starts to read the second line of the story, and she stops. And she looks at me. And she looks at the book, and she looks at me. You could see her brain was working really hard, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, her eyes got big, and you could see that she got it. That the story was about her, and that I wrote it. And she dropped the book, and she started to cry. And I leaned over to pick up the book off the floor. By the way, at this point, <laughs> we were all crying. <laughs> I picked up the book off the floor. I handed it back to her, and I said, hey, Mom, if you don't mind, could you read the rest of it? <laughs> and she did. It took her a while. It was pretty emotional for her, for me, for all of us. But my mom read that entire story out loud to everybody. And, you know, it was a big deal for me. It's a big accomplishment for me to have that story published in that book. I was proud of that, absolutely. But by far, by far, and especially now, the most meaningful aspect of that was being able to give it to her and acknowledge her like that. That's how powerful it is. Whether we do it in a big dramatic way or we do it in a simple day-to-day -day way, when we take the time, when we have the courage, and we're willing to look past all the imperfections and challenges and find the things to appreciate about other people and let them know, it's the greatest gift we can give to them. And it's the best way for us to empower not only them, but us and everyone around us. That's the power of appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you.